the Design Futures Council has an annual survey. And this survey is uh, uh, trends, shifts, issues that are likely to disrupt the design professions in the future. And the whole purpose of this is to look at the strengthening of the business models, the competitive fitness uh, of firms, uh, and a future of um, satisfaction, not just success, but satisfaction in all the ways uh, that you can imagine it. This research on forecasts, uh, trends and shifts is done by our core staff at Greenway Group. You can see them here. Jane Gabry, the editor of Design Intelligence, Scott Simpson, my co-author on last two books, uh, Mary Paraboom, who heads up our research operation in Atlanta, Jonathan Ba, you all know Jonathan as the DFC managing director, Doug Parker, who's managing principal of our consulting practice, Austin Kramer, cartoonist and managing editor, and then, and then all of you because you participate. And we get really high levels of participation in the various surveys that we do. And from these, we're able to determine priorities and also define best practice. Here's a slide I showed you a couple of years ago. And I put it in here at the last minute because of what Lisa Gansky said yesterday. Do you remember her saying, we are more connected than we have ever been, except for the people sitting next to us? And so often, uh, I think this describes what is happening in our firms. And here, of course, is the digital age. Honey, there's an architect here who says you bought him on eBay. <laughs> and so we, we have, uh, you know, we don't, it's not as though architects have barcodes yet implanted under their skins, but we, we have uh, some unfolding phenomena in technology that we haven't totally figured out how to use yet. For example, applications. You know there's an app for that, right? Probably will change the ways that we get our work done radically and probably will uh, disrupt all of the technician skills that architects and engineers are currently bringing to their clients through value propositions. We'll suggest that these value propositions will change radically. Now, when we think about the future, we're doing so from a position of, of relative uncomfortability. And here are the questions that we ask. Are we more relevant this year than last? By we, I'm talking about your firms and your organizations and your, your profession. Are we more relevant this year than last? Now, there is something that we can begin to quantify. Uh, what might change next? How do we get better at anticipating? Why do we do the things that we do? We're creatures of habits. Some of our habits are negative habits. Some of our habits lead to the kind of innovation that Ravi was just talking about with predictable manage, ma uh, predictable magic. And how do other people do what we do? How can we learn from them? And are we moving quickly enough with discipline to anticipate the new opportunities and new successes? So our research is designed to answer these questions. We get organized. And we get organized into these quadrants. And you've seen, you've seen this before. And at each of your tables, you have an article that I just wrote with Jane Gabry on 25 trends. And we're talking about those trends leading from commoditization to quintessence, the new definitions of your value propositions that you will measure and be able to prove. And we look at the trajectory of change, in other words, the speed of change, and we look at the importance of change. And we, uh, for this particular survey, use 50 thought leaders who are board members of the Design Futures Council and our senior fellows. And we map them all out and we begin to look at what's becoming more important and what's becoming less important. And we have fun with this and we've got, um, we've got issues that count well over 100 and then we boil them back to what's most important here and now and that's the article that you have on your tables at each of you of the 25 trends, which in this 15 minutes I won't be able to get into in depth. 
But just take a look at this. You can see how we're dramatically moving from a certain kind of profession and towards a different kind of profession. And if I could concentrate on this, um, you know, the baby boomer leadership, well, guess what? We're headed for the, for the Generation X and even Y leadership. And we've got some interesting examples of what's happening here. Away from solo artists and solo disciplines into integrated teams. You're defining those integrated teams. We're moving away from percentage fees into value-based fees, and we've got some interesting business models on that. Working uh, locally and regionally as practices, and so many of you are working globally. In fact, the fees, just the top 30 fees who are practicing locally, from the top 30 firms, their fees last year were $17.8 billion. And, and taken together, if, if you look at the growth from, from 1998 to 2011, that growth in fees uh, has been going up double digits uh, every year, and it has not slowed down even in the face of the recession. We're moving from uh, relatively stable professions in this industry to dynamic and more entrepreneurial professions from processes that were described in our project management uh, manuals of the past as linear. Now we're looking at them as simultaneous and a good deal more complex. From mixed media to BIM, to from design as material art to design as organic sciences, from construction as a very wasteful energy that we have been apologizing for, to construction industry as something that can be much leaner, much cleaner, with much less waste. Um, there have, we have been looking at evolutionary, right, value migrations into the future. Now we're looking at revolutionary, and in fact, they're disruptive. They're killing off firms. And some firms' behavior patterns suggest that they, you know, they're headed for that cliff that they will not be able to recover from. We're moving from command and control artists to visionary team leaders, and by team leaders I mean the kind of teams that have strong quarterbacks and strong coaches and higher motivation and even during times of stress can lead into a future of greater productivity and satisfaction in the professions. We're also seeing from, remember that these are the best of class firms now and they're in the top tiers. These are the tier one firms, the tier two firms that are we call four star firms. Um, the global firms, the national firms, and the U.S. high regional firms that are talked about in the media, that have strong brands, that are winning awards, that have a voice of leadership in the profession. And those earnings are going up, and we're looking at now many of those firms, even in this economy, having, having a bottom lines of 15 percent or more, which is not just sustainable, but is regenerating uh, their future. They're able to invest in technologies. They're able to do so many things. And then, you know, like, like pay good salaries and like having annual bonuses and like taking off-site retreats and planning and, and like uh, instilling some fun things uh, into the firms. And then we're moving from generalist practices to more expert and more branded uh, practices. And what happens is that the financial recession, the economic problems that we have been in, have actually caused many leaders in our profession to experience something even more difficult, and that's an emotional recession, depression, a hard time to get up and lead in organization in times of dynamism. And it's very uncomfortable, and so we sometimes move into a position here of, of dynamism. And these are, are case studies of firms that have failed, right? Uh, in this time, they were not able to get out of denial into enough self-analysis to reinvent themselves. The resistance phase here in this lower left quartile is actually a very positive thing. Then we move into the exploration and into a new commitment to a new vision. And so this is where we see some, um, uh, some very interesting role models coming forward. Um, we do, some of your firms have participated in our LEAP analysis, which measures the 14 components of a culture. But when we look at why are firms succeeding during times of rapid change, 
Um, we, we, we often find that the reasons are right here. These are firms that have a constructive paranoia uh, in them. Uh, the leaders are restless. Uh, they're, they're not ready to sit on their laurels uh, and their legacies. Uh, they're ready to reinvent through constructive paranoia. There's empirical talent uh, in the firms, and there's extraordinary uh, discipline. By uh, empirical uh, talent, I mean that which can be proven, that which is um, smart, uh, that which is the very best of the talented population that we have in our profession. And then the uh, extraordinary discipline. Um, so many pro professional practices do lack the discipline, and therefore they lack the opportunity to become a, a best practice uh, kind of organization. So uh, don't, um, don't diminish uh, discipline and, and its importance. Well, here you can see that this is, what's, this is where, whether you're talking about firm profitability, or whether you're talking about success with BIM, or whether you're talking about uh, morale of the offices, um, these, these repeatable habit patterns that aren't so positive trip us up and we end up here. And uh, we look at the four quadrants, not just professional service and delivery, which can be so text, you know, sexy and, and it captures us and captivates us, but we, we need to look at discipline and operations, marketing and finance. And in operations, it means human resources and the way that we compensate people and the technologies that we deploy in our organizations. And once we find the way, we don't go back to the old way. Once we find that way and we can navigate it, we wondered why we ever gave in to the other, um, uh, to the other status, which was a status quo uh, as, as, as more of a laggard, not nearly as satisfying as the potential uh, can hold for. I'll come back to this if we have time uh, later today. Now, I just would like to show you uh, optimistic optimism and pessimism in the profession. Sixty-two percent of professionals in our in our panel are optimistic right now. Last year it was 73, and by the way, the year before that it was 60. So uh, in your mind, uh, ask questions and why you think we're less optimistic this year than last year. And here you can see that the target rate of utilization per full-time equivalent for 2012 70.3 percent. Last year it was 70.1 percent. The year before that it was 68.2 percent. So that's creeping up a little bit. And then you can see the target rate of net revenues per full-time equivalent is now at 125. Now um, the gross numbers are way over that, about 210 uh, to 350 of gross revenues per full-time equivalent. Uh, this net number is down slightly uh, from last year, which surprised us. We frankly expected it to be up. The economic forecast, you, I just would like, because, because all of this is in your handout and you'll be able to re read it in your leisure, just do some contrast between architecture and civil engineering on this slide. Look at the difference here between uh, MEP engineering and construction management being quite similar, but look at the difference between environmental graphic design and interior design. And here you see uh, an analysis with a similar format. Uh, more depth is in the next issue of design intelligence, but here you can see, look at the difference, just for example, between um, educational facilities and government facilities, local, and health care facilities. And you begin to, and it gets interesting when you drill down to the state. First of all, public-private, then states, then counties, gets pretty interesting. And here you can see a few more industrial buildings versus mixed-use facilities here and renovation and adaptive uh, re reuse here. But plenty, plenty of opportunities, but they're moving targets, and sometimes firms are not prepared. They're, they're stuck in a an area of decline, either a regional area of decline or otherwise. Uh, on the global side, uh, here you can see the bullish, which is black, which is 16 percent for the United States, a, a kind of an attitude that underpins strategies, if you will. Uh, bearish, which is red, also at 16 percent. 69 percent say that they have a neutral of opinion about the global forecast. That said, Greenway Group is still predicting 
uh, that those firms practicing globally will experience about 13 percent growth uh, this year. Look at the difference between Asia and Europe. Now, so this context is changing. We've been talking about it for the last couple of days. The context uh, in the environment, with technologies, with our demographics, with the uh, changing marketplaces, with competitors, it's all changing. A lot of the strategies deployed by the architecture profession are for this old context. So we're wasting the resources of our organizations until we align and calibrate with the new context. And uh, I'm going to just suggest that, that uh, we, we want to get on to the second curve. I think that's why we're all here uh, at, this, uh, at, at this Design Futures Council meeting uh, this year. And we see examples of this being achieved. Um, if we look in the rearview mirror, we can study it that way. If we look in the future and forecast it, we can have some confidence about that as well. I'm going to just say that uh, uh, imagine these. I, I wrote about them in the article that you have. We won't have a chance this morning to get into the depth of these, but these are some of the things I'd like to be talking with you about over lunch and at dinner and in our times together. But during this 15 minutes, um, this, um, consider this one. The average lifespan of professionals were sur will surpass 100 years in 2025. Um, that's the, that's the uh, consensus of the Association of Professional Futurists, by the way. And so um, how might that change the profession? And how might computers that exceed human intelligence change the profession? And what about those architects who depend on technician skills rather than leadership skills? So look for all of this in upcoming issues of design intelligence. Thank you for sharing this 15 minutes with you.